It's really a, a pleasure and honor. Uh, you guys can't imagine what this means to me being here uh, again, but now as a, as a faculty and uh, hopefully sharing some of my insights and some of my experiences and uh, especially learning from, from such a, an incredible a crowd. Uh, you got a lot of gadgets in here, so I hope they, they do work. But, uh, but anyways, that's my name. I'm a general surgeon. I do uh, a, from uh, a regular general surgery, bread and butter stuff, to a robotic surgery. And half of what I do is trauma and emergency surgery. So that gives me sort of a, a clinical advantage, a clinical uh, insight of, of sorts. Uh, trauma is my, my main specialty, really. And uh, uh, what we do is related to you know, high energy. You know? uh, you can get in a car crash because of uh, bad lifestyle decisions, <laughs> and uh, then you can end up like this, which is a, a, a life sucks disease, right? When you get something like this. Uh, again, robotic surgery, I've always liked gadgets, and I think that really gadgets are what, what, uh, what uh, get me going to try to take care of my patients in the best way possible. Uh, I'm passionate about gadgets, but my real passion is really my patients. So, uh, uh, I've been in telemedicine for many years, and then I, I had the idea to use a mobile device, an iPod Touch, and then a smartphone to do telemedicine, connecting people hundreds of miles away in, in Maine. It's a very useful tool. I, that ended up uh, uh, to uh, me getting selected to do a TEDx talk, and then I started learning about social media for healthcare, and I started in Twitter, which is the main way I used to communicate with people in regards to getting information and to giving information. And then that landed me at Singularity University following Dan Kraft for a few years, and finally took the, 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 the courage to say, you know, I got to go, I got to do it, I got to invest on this, so I did, and I went to Future Med, which is uh, the, the old uh, exponential medicine, it's much smaller and a bit more intense and longer, but thank God I did, because that got me exposed to some incredible technology. Uh, one of them was a Google Glass, and Google Glass, we had a Babak Parvis from Google, the guy who basically invented the glass, and when I saw Babak, I cornered him, like for two hours after his talk, and... Uh, basically told him, listen, I think this is going to revolutionize the way we, we, we care for patients. And having a computer not here or here, but here is just going to make it happen. And also to help us teach students. And um, anyways, I got the glass a few weeks later, and then I went and gave a conference in Paris, a, a Doctors 2.0, a great conference in Paris, the sort of top conference every June, and I recommend it. And then there I gave the first talk with Google Glass on, the first medical talk, I guess, ever. I didn't even know how to use it. I hadn't read the instructions yet, because I got it in New York and flew to Paris. And, but then a few days later, I came back to the US, and I said, you know, I'm going to use this in the operating room. And uh, I did. I got permission from the patient and the family. I used it, uh, streamed my operation, my perspective to a group of students in the nearby room. You know, easy, intuitive, no big deal. I wrote a little post about that. And my friend John Nosta from Nosta Labs, Forbes uh, a contributor, he wrote a story. And within hours, it was viral. And he was like, whoa, what is this? So, and then it was all over the news. And that started sort of my path as a communicator, as a communicator, as a connector. And uh, I'm a full-time general surgeon. I'm a full-time surgeon. I'm not sort of a business person. My, 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 my goal is to try to bring ideas to the clinical need and then to communicate that to the public, to the patients and the providers. I started a blog, and then the blog uh, turned into a web uh, page, sort of, that uh, I use for education of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of general public. Uh, and then exploring technologies, you know, you saw robotic surgery, and uh, robotic surgery is, is an awesome thing, and people think, wow, robotic surgery, but that's old stuff, this is the new stuff. Robotic surgery through a single port with these snake-like instruments that really allow you to really change the face of surgery. Not the robotic surgery that we, we all have seen with the Da Vinci robot. And I'm not here to talk to you about other incredible technologies and what the future is going to be like, you know, bio, 3D printing, nanotechnology really helping us take better care of patients and prevent and treat and rehab disease. That is stuff that has been already uh, talked about uh, at length you know, here. And, and then, uh, you know, things like, like artificial intelligence, deep learning systems, computerized, so the integration of a machine with deep learning capabilities to diagnose and treat and help us better care for, for people. I don't know if you've seen this movie, but Hero 6 is just a phenomenal movie. It's a, something that really, it's, it's kind of for kids, but it's not. It, it's really, this is happening. This is already happening in a, in a more serious uh, format. It's a machine that allows a, a diagnosis and allows and suggests uh, therapeutics. So it's a kind of a fun. And uh, you've seen, uh, you know, a, a, a integration of a neuro brain 
computer interfaces to uh, restore you know, mobility in patients who are uh, uh, disabled. And if you're a fan of soccer, you saw that uh, the first kick of the World Cup in Brazil was a teenager who was completely paralyzed, and he was basically thinking about walking and kicking, and he did it. And that was the first kick of the last uh, World Cup in Brazil recently. And uh, again, technology is just incredible, and I think that can help us do a better job. So healthcare is in trouble, and you, you all know that. And the first reason, I think, is the, the cost. You know, it's a, it's a, a shameful, unsustainable cost in the trillions of dollars. And this is an old figure from 2009 and 2009. And, uh, and not just the cost, but the fact that we, we, we rather than help, we, we uh, injure, we damage some more people. Almost 500,000 people die every year in only the United States from preventable errors, medical errors. Imagine that. And some people debate this number. Some people say it's, it's uh, you know, 44,000. Some people say it's 10,000. It doesn't matter. If it's one person that has a problem or dies from a preventable uh, 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 error, something that, that could be changed before it happens, then we should work on that. The other issue is the deficit of providers. You know, we have so many more patients, people growing older and living longer, and then we have less and less numbers of providers. And that impacts, obviously, medical education. If you have less money, you're going to cut on the medical education first, and then you're going to get to have less providers. High demand and short supply. So technology, it's fascinating, right? But I think technology used in a smart way can really help us prevent this from, from getting worse and hopefully improving it. This is a short uh, a, 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 a paragraph in there from, from Terence McKenna, one guy that I follow quite a bit. It says, technology is our skin. You know, technology is really part of humans. You know, some people don't like technology at all. Some people love technology. I'm kind of in between, but I think technology is part of us. And as you can read there, you know, really technology is what really makes us human. It's like the scaffold to where we can grow and then become better, you know, from making stone tools to, you know, flying uh, uh, spaceships to, 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 to Mars. So that is a, 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 the, the, the point. Innovating, having smart ideas on how to use technology that is existing already, that is where we, we, we need to go. Uh, in medicine, you go to the doctor and uh, there is, you know, millions of office visits in the United States, in the world every day. And the fact is that most of those visits that you go, you take your car, you drive, you spend gas and time and miss school and work and go to the doctor for a few minutes, most of those visits do not require touch, do not require physical, physical touch by the provider. And that's where telemedicine comes in, your virtual presence applied to healthcare, to providing diagnosis or care on a patient. You know, one in six visits this year were e-visits, you know, kind of integration to what telemedicine is. It takes about 20 to 30 days to get an appointment in the United States with a general practitioner. That is, that's, that's, that's a shame. That's uh, a, a impossible to, 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 to go, to keep going that way. We're expecting that in just a couple of more years, we're going to have, you know, more than 100 million video consoles for medicine. And that is going to grow, and it's growing exponentially for sure. Every few days, we have, you know, a new telemedicine company. We, we heard about Curly, which is a, a, a telemedicine. It's like having a doctor in your pocket, like you, if your doctor, your brother, your friend was a doctor, and you just text him with a question or her with a question, and then you get an answer. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. That brings us to, again, the video connectivity, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Well, a video is worth a thousand pictures. We created a network of telehealth sites in Maine, cameras in the back of the rooms in the ED, and a, a screens in the front connected to 17 sites in Maine. The area that we cover is uh, as large as Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and together, one doctor, 24-7, is covering the whole area. So imagine the, the need for connecting and improving access to physicians and to uh, patients. That is very important. We created that network, and then that uh, migrated to mobile cards. We could you know, manage the remote camera from our place and move the camera from side to side, and we could really connect and have a great picture. We could zoom in, zoom out, right and left, but that was bulky, that was expensive, that takes resources, IT, money, and then we said, you know, why do that when we can use mobile devices? You know, I'm from Venezuela, so I called my mom on the phone, you know, a few times a week or a month on video. She's in Venezuela, you know, thousands of miles away. Why can I not do that, connecting to a doctor 200 miles away? So we started thinking about that, and then we said, wow, this is a 
multi-billion dollar industry as well. So let's do it. And mobile is, is mobile. You know, I'm not talking about mobile like this. I'm talking about, you know, smartphones and cell phones. You know, you know, probably heard this, there are more cell phones in the world than there are toilets and there are toothbrushes. And, and that's, that's the way it is. It's a culture thing. You know, the guy who's not having the, the smartphone, that's the guy who's the weirdo. And we're changing the homo erectus to, you know, like someone like evolving this way. And that is not the right thing to do. So using a smartphone, we started connecting with patients in the telehealth network. And that was really, really something that was very, very uh, successful. And then I was in Dubai recently and I saw this video. You know, this is Darshan, the symbol of Dubai in a way. They put a little mini GoPro camera there, not a GoPro, but a mini one, and then you could stream what the eagle was seeing. If we can do that, we should be able to do you know, telemedicine in the ambulances, in, 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 in remote and mobile uh, scenarios. You know, this is the M3, the micro mod uh, uh, computer. It's a self-sustaining computer created at the University of Michigan, and this is already you know, a year or so old. So imagine the power of computing exponentially growing and making us better. All these devices that you know, we, we can uh, 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 use, electromyogram that translates into a computer, a coach, I got the Aura Ring, which is a tracker, uh, just like the Fitbit, a respiration, a breathing a, 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 a monitor. We heard about Think and Muse yesterday. You know, things that are really changing the way we, 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 we do medicine in a way. Brings us to Google Glass, which you're all familiar with probably. So I'm not going to play the video, but it's a computer, a smartphone in your face, not obstructive. And you can activate it with touch, with touch, again, I'm going to say with touch and with voice. For a surgeon who's sterile operating, you cannot use touch. So that brings us to the next generation. And Google Glass evolved over obviously a few years to what it is now. And the old computers you know, were so heavy, the, the head-mounted computers that we had to have wires so the patient wouldn't break their necks, you know, the, the person. So that has certainly evolved in a way that, it's, that is natural. I always bring that video because it's a video of the natural evolution of the office that Jose Marquez talked about yesterday, this natural evolution of the device. You know, we have a, a, a really devices becoming smaller, becoming mobile, becoming more, in a way, a useful for us. From the big computers out there to computers that are now head-mounted. If you recognize this, anyone? It's Terminator, right? Head-mounted computer with, you know, reading capabilities, with uh, inputting data. So this is, you know, how many years ago? 25 years ago or something, that movie? Well, that's happening now. And Hollywood always gets it right, you know? You can see that, and it's pretty much like that. Every 10 years, we do something that Hollywood does, including that Hero 6, the movie that we saw. And this is a video that I'm going to go short, but this is the future of medical education, where you're going to have the student really integrated remotely and virtually with all sorts of uh, a, a, a ways to not just learn, but learn to treat a patient. And I wish we had some more volume, but... Uh, you know, this is all happening. We can do this. This is a little uh, a science fiction type video, a couple years old from the University of Virginia. At your own pace. But you know, this is this is happening already. We all have done this. So I think that uh, technology, this is solid from Google. To track no. human hand. Just tracking a radar, the tracking radar you micro movement, allowing you to control without touch. That brings us to this uh, glass, which is I'm going to go. This glass is uh, this a, a fear glass. Trying to detach us from the Just device, you can, you can taking touch. care of not touching anything. And then this device is a theater glass, which I want to try to play for you here a little bit. A theater is a computer in your, uh, in your forehead that it is obstructing, but it's a computer. And we can get the video there. So I'm not touching anything, it's just gesture. Remember Minority Report? So the same thing. You can basically open, and you can start playing with that hard, and move it in ways that you, know, you couldn't do if you had to touch. So you can be in the OR, and imagine integrating this to be, let's go back to the slides, imagine integrating this to the EMR and being in the OR, not needing to touch anything, and suddenly be able to you know, have access to the information. Imagine having touch surgery, a platform that they talked about a couple days ago, where it's a digital atlas, it's a 3D digital atlas. Imagine that in a glass that you don't have to touch. You can gesture, you're learning how to do an appendectomy, and then you go ahead and you do it in the air. So that's the potential of getting better. We've heard of HoloLens, we've heard of other devices like ODG and Meta. 
the future is here now, and it's only going to get better. This is a very inexpensive modality. Just a couple, you know, 20 bucks or something, you get your device, you download the free app, and suddenly you have an Oculus Rift homemade. And Dr. Schaaf is going to talk next about the potential of immersive reality to not just teach people how to do an operation, but how to do teleconsulting or telementoring. So imagine the possibilities, integrating this with the EMR. You know, imagine, I'm going to go quickly, but it's disrupting the data. We do the same way we did it in the days of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the printing press. But instead of pen and paper, we use keyboards and we use computers. We really need to reverse the flow of data. Not the human input in data, but the AI and deep learning system really bringing data to us so that we prevent medical errors. It's about communication. It's about connectivity. It's about having smart ideas to really get there. And I'm going to go through this real quick, but 40 is the number of wrong site surgeries that we do in the United States every week. And 40 times, despite the fact that we cannot touch the patient unless we check which type of surgery we're going to do, right breast, left breast, right eye, left eye, and we still, 40 times a week, we take the, the, the wrong organ or attack the wrong site. Okay, glass. So that is not something that we should accept. Integrating Google Glass, for example, to situations where you have a Google Now for healthcare, helping you do surgery, helping you take care of patients, that's where the future needs to be. In medical education, in telementoring, having a computer that you can access, and especially in medical education for surgery, where instead of being looking behind the surgeons, you know, back, you can be there doing the surgery. You can ask the surgeon questions, you can be asked questions, and you have the same perspective than the surgeon does. So that is what we should, you can be remotely located, and, and Shafi, Dr. Shafi will talk about that, because teleconsulting and telementoring are really the new frontiers. This is Christian Assad, a singularity person as well, a cardiologist, a Google Glass explorer and pioneer in the cardiology area. We did the first glass-to-glass -glass simulated scenario, and uh, it, it was phenomenal. People talk about doctor-patient interaction and depersonalizing medicine. It's completely the opposite. If you have gone to doctors, you know, the doctor says hello and then turns away from you, starts using the computer, and then asks you a question and doesn't even look at your eyes. So we can change that with devices that are really head-mounted. You improve the empathy. We talked about empathy yesterday between doctor and patient. You can hold someone's hand, you can embrace someone while you have the computer as a rear-view mirror unobstructively showing you the information that, that you need. So I think that the future is going to be phenomenal. I think that Albert was wrong. He said that we're going to turn into idiots because of technology. I think it's about the smart use of the technology. Not the technology itself, it's the idea behind how to use the technology that we have. How to use an iPod that was created for music and play to save lives. That's where we need to go. And I'll leave you with this. Samsung VR, the uh, launching video, 3,500 miles. Dad is here in Australia. Mom is having the first baby here. And with a totally immersive reality situation, using Samsung VR, they connected the dots. And they allow Dad to be there remotely. We can do this for medicine. We can do this for education. So this is the way to go. And I think the future is going to be super bright. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here. So this is a great example of a clinician melding with technology. You don't need to invent the VR, AR headset. Um, and sometimes we need to help the technologists. I actually met with the Google Glass team uh, a, a, a couple years before they sort of launched, and they weren't really thinking about the healthcare applications. The consumer side hasn't necessarily taken off, but uh, they are developing new versions of Glass, and others are building AR, VR headsets. Uh, and I think it's uh, beholden to us to interact with and help create the spec sheets for what we need, whether it's in a smartphone, a wearable mobile device, uh, an EMR platform. So uh, we're going to bring out our, our next faculty member, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, earlier this year in Dubai at a digital health uh, meeting. Um, a lot of uh, folks coming from around the world, as, as to here. Um, Dr. Uh, Shafi uh, Ahmed is a consulting surgeon in London, cancer surgeon. Um, and he's sort of been at the leading edge of thinking about where we can take uh, the education of the medical student, the surgeon, uh, in the future and today using the world of augmented and virtual reality. So, Shafi. Uh, 
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Daniel. Thanks very much for asking me to talk at uh, SU and Exponential Medicine. Um, it's not a privilege to be here among such distinguished guests, of course, and to really follow on from visionaries like Ralph um, and sort of uh, Raphael Grossman. Um, it's been a privilege to be here. Um, now, I'm going to ta start talking big about wearable technology and about how we utilize these things. A lot of the stuff that we talk about is aspirational. We have gadgets around, but actually, how do we use it in clinical practice? That's probably the way we manage to go forward, and clinicians are going to be part of that. Now, I work in a fairly modern hospital. We've been around for at least 900 years, of course, so not as modern as you possibly can think. And actually, over the course of 900 years, we've had ma many famous alumni, and the most famous of all for relevant to today's meeting is probably William Harvey, who discovered circulation. We look at biosensors, Apple watches, looking at heart rate, blood pressure, saturation levels, the uh, Triacorder uh, X Prize, all around uh, interventions and discovering diagnosis. So William Harvey is a key element, I think, all of this. I'm pleased to say that he worked at our institution. Talk about singularity. Uh, let's talk about surgical singularity. Let's think big. At some point, what do we want? We want surgeons to be automated, maybe. How do you automate a robot to take a history, examine a patient, pick up a scalpel, make a cut, and get an operation carried out successfully? That's going to be our nirvana, or our surgical singularity. And we have a step ways, sort of ways managing that to go forward. There's a bigger picture. Some of you may be aware, earlier this year, in April, the Lancet Commission produced its report for the first time quantifying the problems of surgery. Five billion out of the world's population have no access to safe and affordable surgery. Simple operations, we're not talking about advanced robotics, it's simple things like appendicectomies. In fact, we need 143 million extra operations to make the healthcare more equitable throughout the world. And of course, that requires a number of surgeons, over two million. It's estimated that by spending 420 billion US dollars, we can save $20 trillion in the future. That's an investment I'm keen on thinking about how we explode. Many things need to happen to make that work, of course. It's governments, it's workforce planning, it's finance. But also, it's about training education. And this is where my talk will go through next, about how we think big and how we think exponentially. This has been troubling me for many years. Dogma, tradition, surgery, we're steeped in tradition. We've got to change our ways. We've been the same thing for years and years. Uh, this is back in 1870, and of course, London Hospital, uh, 1920. This is a bit crowded, to say the least. You cannot possibly train anybody in that environment, and we think we can. The fact that you can stand behind a surgeon, and this godlike figure will teach you just by being in front of you, is nonsensical. It's got to change. The dogma is ridiculous. This is my mantra. All my students know this. We need to challenge the dogma and tradition using technology. I really think that's the way forward, and this will hopefully uh, be sort of obvious from my talk. What is it? It's about connectivity. We you know Project Loom is coming up next year, clouds of internet across parts of the areas of the world that have no access. So that's amazing. Of course, also we were troubled by the Syrian refugee crisis. This went viral, of course. Very sad. Facebook have decided to make every refugee have the ability to have internet access. It's about global health, about globalization, it's about connectivity. So how do we use that in practice? So a year ago, I thought we had a glass, Google Glass, we thought we'd use it in a bigger way. I can train one person, I can train two persons. Can I train a hundred? Can I train a thousand or more? So we did a live operation last year. We used the streaming device on Google, the app let us go to any person in the world who could literally get a mobile phone or an iPad or a computer, access live stream through points of view of my operation. Okay? They could also text me during the operation, so I could pick up their text and answer around the globe any questions they may have had. And actually, if you look at the Google Analytics after that, we watched by almost 14,000 people okay, across the globe, really expanding the horizons of connectivity and teaching and learning. So this was 132 countries, and you can see virtually the whole globe was covered with, by one simple operation. So it's a way, effective way of perhaps teaching and learning, but discovering new ways around it. And interestingly, people like in Australia, who are part of the first world, but feel isolated. 5,000 viewed the operation because they're so keen to be part of this bigger world that we live in, and it became much smaller as a result of it. This is our current platform. We have two glasses, the surgeon, the assistant, both looking at the operation, the medical students in the corner of the room 
asking questions, typing them in, or it can be thousands of miles away. There's a chat box on the right-hand side. That chat box allows peer-to-peer -peer teaching. They teach one another about global issues, about the operation. Some of those questions are put in the glass so I can moderate better. Actually, the operating theatre is a theatre. It's a theatre of ambition. It's a theatre of learning. That's my role. That's what it's called, a theatre. We moved on with a company called AMA, working on a suitable solution for streaming that's more robust, and they're a glass certified partner. And this is about telemedicine, telementoring. How do we suddenly open up a platform, connect to consultants around the world, get second opinions? This is an easy method, you can, and it's a great, useful way of connecting people for health, but also for education. Let's move on. Virtual reality. It's a great term. It's, it's coming in, lots of money being thrown at it. You know, Facebook bought out Oculus Rift for 2.1 billion US dollars. They weren't buying the device, they were buying a concept of virtual reality. And now all the other companies are in line, pushing as hard as they possibly can. It's a continuum. If you think about papyrus or tablets, paper, then we go down to books, iPads, smartphones, AR and VR. It's a continuum of learning. We've got to understand how we use this new continuum and this new medium that's called VR. We're discovering ourselves. We are, I've got a company called Medical Realities. We're thinking, how do we change the world with VR? We talked about Google Glass projecting out. What about bringing the person back to you from somewhere in Africa or somewhere in Asia into your operating theatre? That makes it much more equalised. And this is what we're trying to do with VR. So I'm just going to go ask Daniel Kraft to come in to demonstrate what we're doing. Ed's my co-founder for Medical Realities, and Dan, should we put it on, head on down? Thank you, as a chair. So what we'll do, we'll show... Dan will be immersed in our operating theatre for a few minutes. I'll show it live on here about what he's doing and what he's looking at. Um, and what you can do, of course, if you go to YouTube app on your phones, go for Medical Realities, poke the video, you can look around in 360 at the same operation that he'll be looking at. So it's worth doing that if you can get a chance at some point. OK, do you want access this? <laughs> so Dan's always wanted to be a surgeon, you see. I think this is his one and only chance, I think, of getting it right. OK, so this is what he'll be watching. Um, it's going to play in a second. Feel free to look around throughout the experience to gain a full perspective of the patient journey. Throughout the demo, tap hard on the side of the headset. So we can create patient education. We looked at booklets, leaflets. CD-ROMs, DVDs, but how about being the patient, being educated in VR? You can experience the journey from the ward into the operating theatre. You can see what's going on with people training you, doing consent. You can do all of that before you get to the operating theatre. And so hopefully this is what uh, Dan is seeing at the same time. You can then whisk that away into the operating theatre and to be next to me, watching over my shoulder about how I do an operation or any other surgeon around the world that you might want to be with. We can almost do it in real time fairly soon so you can transmit yourself in one go. And that's where we're heading towards. So this is just the preamble and then we go straight into the operating theatre and you'll see what it looks like. Here we go. This is, off here. This is the uh, WHO checklist being carried out. Okay? And you can see what's going on here with the operating list. There's the patient. Okay? You can swim around, you can zoom in into the feeds from laparoscopic stacks. You can watch the operation, you can watch my technique. You're not going to be behind three or four other people to think about how to do this. Should we go further forward, Scott? After identifying each member of the room and their role, surgeon and anaesthetist must confirm the name of the patient. Okay, so you can imagine this is going to sort of transform sort of the way we teach and educate people. There we are, there's the operation. You can the video come in, you can see things going on. We'll move on. Can we go back? Oh, there we are. There we are, here it is. Now, it's live operation. Is now okay, so you can now experience live operation to anyone in the world at any one point. So you can introduce the entire globe into your operating theatre. Okay, that's the way we transform. That's the way we become exponential in how we teach the world and make it more equitable. So I hope that Dan's still not feeling too queasy. You okay, Dan? Thank you for that, Dan. Thank you very much. One end of the bow. That should be scrubbing it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Look at that. See that? Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. 
and you can watch it, download it, and feel free to comment and give me comments about what you think this is going to. I'm happy to take ideas from all of you. This is interesting. Yeah. How does it feel looking at, you, looking at that whole environment? That's strange. So, so, interestingly, this is the lady watching her own operation in virtual reality. How bizarre is that? How crazy? But why not? Why not challenge dogma? Why can't she watch her own operation? It's her. She really wants to watch it. And her husband. They pushed me hard. So she viewed her own right hemiclectomy for cancer. And actually, maybe we should be doing more and showing our operations more openly and showing that becoming more transparent uh, by definition. Ladies and gentlemen, to inspire people, we need to really think about how we move this world on, how we make it equitable, how this technology will help the globe to make sure that we deliver some of the possible solutions um, from the Lancet Commission. Um, obviously, in terms of science, we need to make sure people stand together to make sure we inspire our youngsters, particularly our medical students, our trainees. This was quite touching. I want to have a new hashtag. I hope you can share that hashtag in the next couple of days. So to create science, we stand with people like Ahmed and other youngsters who want to do work. But to change exponentially, I think we need to jump with Daniel. Okay? And actually, this was the Royal London Hospital when I first met Dan. And of course, we couldn't resist another one at Singularity. Thank you very much.